I've done several videos already on creatine, but I wanted to do this other video on an aspect of creatine that is very rarely discussed yet is pretty important, uh, and that's the effect of creatine on the brain. Uh, as I've discussed in, in past videos, creatine is best known for its ability to maintain muscle energy stores through its production, uh, through its interactions with ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. It's the most elemental source of energy. All the food you eat, protein, fats, carbohydrates, eventually they get the, the, uh, the calories and whatever you want to call it, they become degraded or broken down into ATP in a uh, portion of the cell called the mitochondria. ATP doesn't last very long. It only lasts for about 6 to 10 seconds. But the muscle stores creatine along with phosphate. And um, the creatine uh, can contribute one, uh, some of its phosphate to the regeneration of ATP. That, and uh, that basically is the main function of creatine. And mu uh, muscle also has buffer functions. It helps to lower acid. It has some kind of uh, uh, anabolic effects. It might increase insulin-like growth factor 1 in the muscle. Um, and, uh, of course, it has an osmotic effect that draws water into the muscle. Uh, this is called cellular hydration, which uh, also produces anabolic effects. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I've kind of discussed all that. I won't get into that again in this particular video. I want to focus on the effects of creatine on the brain, which I say is, is not often discussed, but it can affect your training energy and your thinking ability. The scientific uh, word for thinking ability is cognitive ability. Uh, one thing I came across, though, in uh, doing some research recently, in some of my past videos, I've mentioned that um, some of the uh, earliest uh, forms of creatine appeared um, uh, to be used by the East Germans and Russians in the 70s. They gave vials of creatine phosphate to their athletes in the early um, 70s. And that was, I think, I thought that was the first uh, use of supplemental creatine, but it turns out that uh, there's a man who's referred, a German uh, man who's referred to as the father of biochemistry. He actually sold a meat extract that contains 8% creatine as a mental invigorating sub substance, uh, and he sold this to support his scientific work. And this was in the 19th century. So this creatine has been around a lot longer than people think. But getting back to the uh, cognitive effects of creatine, uh, they've known for years that you know uh, creatine is mainly produced in the, in the liver, pancreas, and kidneys uh, through the... Uh, uh, Three, from three amino acid precursors, uh, methionine, arginine, and glycine. Uh, but it's also produced in smaller amounts in the brain. Uh, and there's a, um, the, the, in the liver, there's a, a couple of enzymes that participate in the synthesis of creatine. Uh, one of the uh, final enzymes involved, uh, one of the, what they call the rate limiting enzyme, goes by the acronym GMAT. Now, there's a couple of uh, situations where there's genetic abnormalities where uh, uh, th there's birth defects where people are born without lacking this uh, enzyme in the brain, GM uh, GMAT, and this leads to imp impaired brain development. Now, it just that, that is an indication of just how important creatine is to brain function because if these people are born without this enzyme, they, they have uh, brain defects. Uh, a, a lack of sufficient oxygen delivery to the brain can impair thinking abilities, and creatine can help reduce that. Uh, there's various, uh, I'm not going to get into what causes a lack of oxygen. Um, could be heart, heart problems, it could be a, even a stroke, but uh, creatine will decrease some of the damage that's caused by a lack of oxygen de delivery to the brain, which is also known as hypoxia. Creatine, in that instance, can actually pr uh, protect the neurons in the brain from uh, a lack of oxygen because uh, if the neurons don't get sufficient oxygen they basically die. Creatine also help relieve depression and, and it augments this treatment of depression by standard antidepressant drugs particularly what they call serotonin uptake inhibitor drugs like Prozac. If you take creatine with these antidepressants it actually increases the efficiency of the antidepressants in relieving depression. Now, vegans, uh, uh, vegans, of course, don't eat the animal foods such as meat and fish that get, are the richest sources of creatine. So theoretically, uh, they have lower uh, body stores of creatine. 
however, creatine is made in the liver. As long as you get those amino acids, your, your body will produce a gram a day of creatine in the liver. And uh, when they've compared vegans with, uh, uh, with people that, are, uh, that eat meat or non-vegetarians, the amount of uh, creatine in the brain is similar. So even though the uh, vegans have less creatine stores compared to meat eaters, for example, the amount of creatine in the brain is about the same, which is another indication of just how important creatine is in the brain because the body will make it even if you don't eat the foods that contain, uh, that contain creatine. Now, if you give, uh, despite the fact that uh, vegans have about the same amount of creatine in their brain, if you give them uh, creatine supplements, which, which, by the way, are synthetic, they don't contain animal products, so they're suitable for vegans. If a vegan ingests a creatine supplement, not only does he get a much more pronounced, let's say, energy effect from the creatine in the, you know, in the training, but they also get a better mental effect uh, from the creatine. They, uh, they get a clearer thinking and better mental focus, again, because vegans tend to have lower creatine stores. And this is also true despite the fact that vegans have the, about the same amount of creatine in the brain as non-vegans. Uh, creatine also works well to increase brain power in older people. You know, as you age, everything starts to kind of slow down, production of hormones, and also the, the production of creatine gets a little bit less efficient. So if you give creatine to an older person, you can also have a pretty good effect on, on uh, brain function. Uh, by helping to maintain optimal energy uh, status in the brain, creatine can help improve the brain performance of older people. One study of creatine found that it was able to negate the mental effects associated with lack of sufficient sleep. Uh, kind of a brain fog. So if for some reason you don't get enough sleep and you know, you, you, you know, you're know feeling a little foggy, if you take creatine, it actually seems to clear that up. And again, this is related to the fact that creatine uh, is an energy source for the brain. It's involved in brain energy reactions. In many senses, creatine can be viewed as a nootropic or a smart nutrient because of its benefits, uh, beneficial effects on brain function and it, because it has the ability to increase focus, attention, and memory. And those are the attributes of a, nootro a nootropic uh, nutrient. Well, nootropic basically means increasing brain function, increasing cognitive ability. Athletes who suffer from brain con uh, concussions also show low uh, brain energy levels because of a decrease in brain creatine. When you, know, when you get a concussion, your, the creatine level in your brain drops. Creatine may help in the, in the treatment of several neurological diseases such as Parkinson's disease and others that are characterized by a deficit in brain energy production, including Alzheimer's disease. However, the initial studies that showed that creatine helps uh, or is very beneficial for treatment of Parkinson's disease or prevention of Parkinson's disease was in animals. And, and when, they, uh, when they did the human uh, studies that where they gave uh, people at risk for Parkinson's or people already had early Parkinson's, when they gave them creatine, unfortunately, the creatine didn't have much of an effect for reasons that are unknown. But I will say that, you know, there's a lot of studies that involve animals, mice, and other types of animals. These type of studies don't always translate to human physiology. In fact, only about half of them do. So anytime you go on the, uh, the Internet and you see some of these so-called science blogs or these websites, where they have this big headline, and you know, and you read it, and it turns out it's a mouse study. Uh, don't look at that as a final evidence uh, evidence type of thing. It's just an initial study. To to be really applied to humans, it has to be. Uh, they have to do several human studies to replicate the results that are shown in animals. Uh, animal studies don't always translate, as as was the case with creatine and Parkinson's disease, to humans. Well, the brain can synthesize creatine. Using creatine in supplement form only slightly increases brain creatine levels. One study showed that ingesting 5 grams or about a teaspoon of creatine a day for 6 weeks increased the brain creatine by 11%. Now, that's not too bad, 11%, but that's not a lot. Now, when they, they, when they put some of these uh, study subjects on a creatine load type of uh, uh, technique, which involves ingesting 20 grams of creatine for a week, Followed by two, cra two grams of, uh, of two grams of creatine a day for another uh, week, this led to an increase of brain creatine of only eight percent. So, strangely enough, taking less creatine, one teaspoon versus uh, let's say uh, four teaspoons a day, 
uh, the one teaspoon actually increased brain creatine more than the creatine load, which is kind of curious, but I have no explanation for that. Now, one thing, the, the reason why you can't really get a lot of creatine or you can't get a lot of creatine in the brain from supplemental creatine is because of something called the blood-brain barrier, which is a network of blood vessels that protects the brain from uh, not possibly noxious substances from entering the brain that can cause brain damage. It's kind of a, um, a barrier to the brain. And uh, unfortunately, uh, creatine, uh, the, the uh, transport of creatine through the protective brain barrier is limited. But ingesting some ingesting supplements does allow some to get through to where you get, again, about an 8% increase in brain creatine. Uh, so creatine, I could sum it all up by saying creatine will not only help your training intensity and your energy level when you're working out, but it'll also aid your workouts by possibly increasing mental focus, concentration, and it'll allow you to kind of tap into your brain-muscle connection more effectively. And so in that respect, creatine is, uh, is a physical and a mental ergogenic aid. So that's, uh, that's it for this, uh, this uh, discussion of, of the brain effects of creatine. Uh, if you want more information on supplements, nutrition, exercise science, hormonal therapy, anti-aging research, fat loss techniques that work, ergogenic aids, and, and uh, preventive medicine, uh, I'm going to ha have a couple of interesting articles on uh, new techniques to prevent cardiovascular disease and cancer. Uh, subscribe today to my Applied Metabolics newsletter, www.appliedmetabolics.com. 40 to, 50, 40 to 50 pages every month. It's just like a, a monthly ebook, all in plain, simple English. I've been a professional writer for 42 years. I know how to write. Uh, I'm not some blogger who you know really doesn't know how to write. And anyone can go on the internet and start a blog. That's not me. Uh, I guarantee you will learn something in every issue of my Applied Metabolics newsletter. Uh, if you subscribe, you, I will also send you an invitation to join my private Applied Metabolics Facebook group where I provide uh, a ton of uh, more evidence as far as medical and, and studies and nutrition, and I also answer questions. Speaking of answering questions, I have an email, email portal on my Applied Metabolics site, and that's strictly for subscribers who want to ask me questions about some of the articles that appear in Applied Metabolics newsletter uh, or give me some feedback, that's fine. Uh, however, that portal is strictly for subscribers. It's not for unsolicited emails where people who are not subscribers ask me questions. I cannot and will not answer those questions. I will only answer it to the subscribers who support my work. Same goes for comments under these videos. You're welcome to leave any kind of comment you want. However, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to answer questions unless you're a subscriber to my newsletter. I just don't have the time, and uh, I owe it to my subscribers because they come first. They, they're, again, supporting my work. I will answer their questions, but I won't answer any unsolicited uh, questions, uh, either submitted to me through the YouTube videos or through my uh, email, email portal or even sent to my email address. So uh, that's the way it is. Uh, if you want to have the best friend you ever have, ever will ever have, go to your local shelter and adopt a dog. Take care.